Perfect. Welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast. Today, I've been told not to try to pronounce Michael's name properly <laughs> with the Dutch pronunciation, so we're going to call you Michael. Welcome, welcome, Michael. Awesome. Hi. Hi. No, Cheers. Thank you for no, having me. Thanks for coming on, man. Um, you obviously highly recommended from our one of our previous guests at the actually i've had how many people have i had from the dutch olympic committee on now including yourself cass matt solomon yourself that's three did i have one more i think you three so far so so far i'm probably going to get through the whole dutch olympic committee on this podcast <laughs> you got a few you got to say a few to go now so uh yeah exactly no but so cass was mentioning some of your your background and kind of where you specialize in as well but do you want to maybe provide a brief background about yourself you know what sports you're working in and and kind of areas of interest in your coaching i guess career yeah that's all good um yeah so i i started as a pe teacher uh and kind of started teaching in in schools and then uh but i always had a a passion for top sport and uh, and strength and conditioning and kind of had an opportunity early in my PE teaching career to to get to do some SNC at an academy at a rugby academy nearby and uh, picked that up was really happy with it and kind of went from there as a as a career part um, that that was in rugby uh, fast forward I worked after that for a few years in gymnastics uh, ice skating and then uh, kind of went from there to, to judo and, and, and snowboard freestyle at the moment. So that's kind of where I uh, I came from and where I'm at now. Damn, it. it's kind of like two opposite spectral ends of the spectrum in sports, doing freestyle snowboarding and then judo. <laughs> I, that, that's a, what a lot of people ask. And then I'm like, at the same, I've thought about it. And at the same time, it kind of keeps me real. So when you work in a combat sport or rugby or, or judo, you always go super hard all the time. It's do or die. Uh, you have to be there, otherwise you lose. Um, and then at the same time, snowboard freestyle is that kind of loose character, yeah. but still have to perform on a bit because it's still a big jump. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's still scary and it, you still have to perform, but it's a different kind of mindset and being in between those two things can keep you more real uh, instead of going with that rugby vibe where music's on 120, going super hard in the gym. And then that, that yeah, it, it helps each other. Nice. Balances each other out. For sure. And then with judo, judo, it's with the judo academy. What what age of um, judo players do you have there? Yeah, so they roughly come in at 17-ish uh, and they'll stay until they're... 22 23 ish uh and then they go they either uh transition out when they don't really make it or they transition to a transition group where they stay for another year to get used to the actual senior level and then after that uh so they're with my colleague and then after that they'll have an option they'll they'll either go on to the olympic layer where they'll end up at their sort of olympic cycle the highest of the level in judo. Um, nice. So we, yeah, we're working with three guys and uh, and uh, and science on top of it, and then um, that's like that's a transition from layer to layer, building them to Olympic athletes. But I'll, I'll, we'll circle back to, back to the academy judo side, but I wanted to touch on today's topic around the title of this podcast, right? Integrating the rehab physio side with the strength conditioning to essentially help accelerate someone's return to play return to training on the mats in the ring on the yep. cage whatever it is and i think a lot of people the ones that aren't that are maybe more recreational in in nature doing the sport maybe they compete a bit they get injured but once they get injured it's okay i'm injured so i'm going to do nothing and then end up slowing their progress or making it worse because they've done nothing and then just once the pain's gone maybe get back on the mats but Maybe let's start with your, your philosophy around this. Around, I mean, obviously different injuries have different approaches, but just the general philosophy around integrating these two together and how someone can go about, or, or why someone shouldn't just sit there and just rest if something does happen. Yeah, so one of the things we looked at is is, is we have a, a mental side to things uh, or, and then a physical side to things, but also 
so those can be two things. Uh, we, we'll, we'll come back to that later. But mostly we can have a reductionist approach to any movement, any type of sport, and bring it back to, to, to whatever we feel like, and then go from there, and then build back up to where we want to be. Um, so that so any anything anything any sport any any movement can be done from from that kind of uh, well looking at it like that, um, and then going from there we can build back up and then uh, get them where we want them to be, and that's back on the mat doing full sessions doing everything. Um, but that's that's a uh, that that rests on multiple pillars like i just said it's a physical there's a mental element to it um but there's also a chance when someone's injured to pick up things that or qualities physical qualities mental qualities any quality that can't be really done in a busy schedule that is mm. judo or or any combat because you're you're always fatigued you're always uh you're always getting punches or bruises or or you're always knackered or whatever so whenever someone singes it's also a great opportunity to pick up those things you normally can't get to because because of that chaos schedule that busyness mm. everything um yeah, no, yeah. That, that that's a good point like i think a lot, a lot of people listen to this combat athletes most of them probably work full-time and then train on top of a full-time schedule get an injury okay maybe don't go to training but what can they fill that time with so if someone does let's just say maybe if there's an example that's recent to you but maybe just a, a random lower body upper body injury what's the first thing obviously see a physio etc this is not medical mm -hmm. advice, but what, what is something they could do uh i guess in that time while they are off the mats and recovering yeah so the, the, the most recent example i have is for upper body so i'll, I'll for, for to answer your question and that is that is what I, I will focus on for yep. now a little bit. So there's, there's, a, there's a few things. First and foremost, the physio comes into the picture. So the physio is like, will deal with uh, that injured part until, until the physio said it's okay to do um, any extra strength on top of the, the easier normal day, day to day task what the physio will do to the shoulder. Uh, and then for me, or what I will focus on is anything that's basically not being treated by the physio. So when you've got your shoulder, you can still do squats, but not with a back squat, but a leg press or, or a belt squat or, or whatever. You still got your other shoulder uh, you can work on. You've got your other arm you can work on. Sometimes you're in a metella, so you, you, you easily don't use it anyway. Um, there's a really good opportunity to work on your conditioning especially getting that that what a lot of combat athletes don't do is getting that easy conditioning in that kind of zone to uh work because you'll be later on you'll be off the mat so long so you lose a bit of that that hard conditioning mm -hmm. that sometimes athletes try to replace that and they go full-on conditioning and then but that that's not going to help you getting back on the mat when you need to get it back on the mat to build up that load because when you get into in that zone two conditioning it will help you recover from when you need to perform or when you need to have those hard sessions again on the mat instead of oh, i'm not doing mat work so i don't get that that zone kind of zone five plus heart rate up uh let's start let's start supplementing that in because i really need that or mm -hmm. let's prepare for when we're actually getting back on the mat, doing rehab stuff, being ready for that and being able to recover from that so that I can do a lot of that kind of work to get quicker back in. Um, would, would there be an argument around not doing too much hard work because it might impair the recovery of maybe the injury? Um, yeah, that could be that could be an argument as well. Um, I've it's more as in um how would i how would i go about that um the body's already trying to recover from something that's mm. maybe torn broken or or and needs yeah. to focus on that um and then at the same time um how do you say yeah, I'm, try, I'm, tr I'm trying to find like, a word for it but yeah, sorry I, I know what you mean it's like kind of like you know you have this injury your body's allocating resources to 
basically fix or whatever it is this injury and then you're layering on top such hard training that those resources get pulled from the recovery to repair other parts of the body in quotation marks because you're doing so much hard work with that is that something that maybe you take into account within within i guess your rehab processes within these athletes at the same yeah there's there's then there's two sides to it there's there's the recovery side which you just explained and at the same time it also when you have to go really hard you also for a shoulder perspective even when you're on the bike you try mm. to when you're on the bike you try to grab that bike handle with one hand and you you'll be you'll be trying to do it with your other hand as well um yeah. so there's also an incentive to to get that shoulder moving or to get that upper body part that's injured moving so it's also a bit of a self-preservation method in terms of well we try to rest it and we try to recover it and the fisio does all the work with it so with me please don't <laughs> don't stress it too much and just go about things and and, and then we'll go from there nice yeah and there's also i think what people people also avoid training the other limb so you mentioned obviously okay you injure one shoulder you have another shoulder um limb you can train do you want to maybe dive into okay what are some of the benefits of training the other side of the body when the other one's injured because people might be like okay i don't want to get i don't want to create imbalances quote unquote i don't want my left arm now to be bigger and stronger than my injured right arm do you want to maybe dive into your your philosophy around that oh well, yeah to start with um i rather want one strong arm than no arms that are strong that's <laughs> let's start with that uh i think we need to be do a fair bit of work to get the other one stronger uh than the other one when in an injured period so go ahead and challenge me on getting that other arm so much stronger than than the other one that's injured because it's kind of challenge you to go do arm wrestling or something and and, and then you probably be <laughs> then you probably win the challenge uh but either than that uh it, you need to do a lot of let's let's call it you need to do a lot of work to 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 get that imbalance going uh, yes there will be an imbalance but there's also a a, a strength transfer uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and i i forgot the exact amount at this point but you you probably have it more prepared than than me but there's a there's a um there's a strength transfer even when your arm's injured to to when you're not training it and but, but you're still training the other limb so yeah doing that that's that's fine there's there's sometimes a problem with like you're trying to do like a dumbbell bench press so you need to and that's like a stability problem sometimes where you still ask something some stability from the other from the whole upper body or the shoulder girdle or whatever and then yeah you get a little of a irritation on the other shoulder sometimes um so you you try to bring it back to floor presses or 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 gotcha seated rows or just <laughs> open chain versus closed chain kind of exercises where you still train it but you try to not ask as much from stability or, or coordination off the whole shoulder girdle in itself yeah yeah that, that cross education effect of that that strength transfer most people aren't aware of that at least i've talked to they as, as we mentioned they avoid training the other side because they don't want to create these imbalances but don't recognize that training that side can potentially speed up the recovery of the injured side plus building the strength plus potentially maintaining some of the muscle mass from training your other limb so it's, it's, it's worth doing regardless and there's there's also enough uh, even if you're in a a, a slightly further f further stage you can add in a blood flow restriction kind of work mm. where you keep the low load and but still ask something from it and you don't even need that lot of movement you can have a blood flow and then only move your arm or have two or three kilos and that doesn't hurt the shoulder in itself or hurt the and you can keep some muscle mass on so there's also always a way when you like i said in the beginning when you you bring it back to the to the to the basics ba most basic part of it of a movement then you can always find a way to to still train it uh, that, that's a good call around blood flow the blood flow restrictions if you want to maybe dive into a little bit of that blood flow restriction maybe just some of the potential how it works you know if you're going to blood flow restriction your shoulder where you would tie it up your favorite exercises and set rep schemes when doing it um i've, I've not been experimenting that much with it though uh there's been some there's been one occasion where i've tried it with uh conditioning in the leg so Ooh keep it on for t yeah it's just, but it's just an easy bike ride for 10 minutes and then put it yeah. on the legs and then have it at a um 
there's ways you can have the the actual um uh the actual pressure and and it's personalized but we'll we'll try to go always with an rp saying uh, it yeah. just needs to feel like it's stuck on a six or a seven it it it's not really strict but then and then we go, do it for uh for 10 minutes on the bike and there's been some protocols about it uh which has been really uh really good so far good results uh but then again it's it's more as in okay let's get that let's get that signal to the to the muscles of you, you gotta get you gotta get working you gotta get working uh just do something even though the body doesn't want to do something and then at that kind of intensity and level that it's not it it's not harmful for the uh um mm. for the muscles in itself so well i can't really explicit name set and rep schemes it's more as so, okay so it's got a the pressure's got to feel a little bit like a six or a seven so it doesn't it doesn't hurt too much it doesn't uh damage anything and then you go somewhere between 10 20 reps just have that little bit of a old school pump going uh yeah. feel like uh feel like schwarzenegger in front of the mirror and, and have a go <laughs> have a go with it and it doesn't hurt anything when you keep it low low intensity and have um yeah, have, have, we have a go about it. Before getting back to the podcast, I want to let you know there's a link down in the description for the Sweet Sounds of Fighting underground community. You can get all the help you need for your combat sports training. You get every single Sweet Sounds of Fighting training program, online course, and you get access to a range of coaches within the private Discord community. So go check that out and back to the podcast. Are, are you taking it off between sets or you keep it on between sets as well? So if you're doing three sets, you keep it on the whole time? We kept we, we we kept it on now for the whole time. Uh, I've not there's there's been there's been protocols and experiments where they take it off, but there's also been instances where they say okay we'll we'll leave it on even after the set for three or two to four minutes, and there's there's been just leave it on and then take it off only after that just for some extra, yeah just some extra build up of uh, everything and then. I've I've not been really going into that that much because also it's not it's not that big a part of a training modality. It's just it it's it's somewhere it's somewhere in between two, three, four weeks and then you can go on to the next one already and then you can so yeah. at least I, that's what you, you hope with an athlete. It's just mm -hmm. that you don't do it for six to eight weeks. Yeah. You just keep it in at some point because that's the at that point the best thing to do of the most efficient thing to do, the most lowest load in order to not damage other tissues yeah so, so just for for the people listening this would be you'll do this on the well you could do it on non-injured limb but you'll do this on the injured limb to essentially be able to train that limb without the pain and without having to load it heavy but still get some of the benefits you would get when you're using heavier loads yeah exactly perfect yeah, that's uh, yeah. and and when you mentioned the bike one I, I like that that sounds brutal even though it's just 10 minutes easy but so you would basically you would tie uh, for people listening, you can use like a, a long voodoo rubber band. You could use like knee wraps or elbow wraps, whatever. But you would tie mm -hmm. these right up the top of your legs, six out of yep. ten. Then sit on a bike. And how how intense are you having someone go on a bike? Is there resistance on that bike as well? Um, yeah, almost no. So when you, you, you chuck a heart rate monitor on it as well, and they just go maybe 110, 120. So that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's like a blue, not even green. It's like upper middle bluish. Gotcha. Um, it's just getting that, it's just adding that, uh, especially when someone's has an ankle or, or a lower limb injury, uh, it's, it's, they can't really put that much pressure on the paddles anyway. And gotcha. then no, no, re, almost no resistance, but just getting that cycle in, then you need no resistance on the paddles, but there's, your legs feel like there's resistance somewhere. So, but it's a non-load bearing thing. So then that, that signals the body to start working again and do some damn thing on those legs. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I had, I was doing some blood flow restriction arms the other week just for a bit of fun. Then I, I tied it up up top and I did mm. like 30 overhead band triceps and then like 25 band curls. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll do three sets. I did one, the pain was so bad I had to take them off. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, yeah. I, I couldn't do anymore, man. The, that, that holding that blood in there is just like, is killer. I don't know how people suffer through it. Yeah, then when when you really enthusiastic younger athletes or or, or top sport athletes go, oh, I want to do that, and they 
put it on so so tight and they they, yeah. they experience the same thing as you just mentioned whereas okay it doesn't have to be that tight it's just a it's only a six out of ten i mean yeah. when i ask you to do a six out of ten squat you don't load it up to 90 percent plus as well so yeah. why would you do it on a on a, on a band <laughs> But then they, they're so enthusiastic about actually using that, doing something with that body part again, that you, you actually have to slow them down. So <laughs> how would you progress, say for a four week cycle, if someone's listening to this and like, okay, they want to implement some of, some of this blood flow restriction, you, or you obviously mentioned 10 to 20 reps, but would you have them do the same thing weeks one to week four, or is there some kind of progression you usually put in place? No, nah, because it, it's, it's, it's kind of self, uh, it, yeah it, it's kind of self-controlling in that way just sometimes because once they get stronger and they feel like they can do more reps they can usually add a little bit more pressure on it um sometimes the weight can also go up because the the the, the muscles just feel well and it's usually just like a finisher kind of thing it's not a it's not a, a, a the, the the main part of a session it's more of a a finisher or, or part of that session at the end where they haven't used that limp yet because we try to we try to afford it a little bit or it's just been to the physio or whatever um so we'll keep it the same and and, and self let it self-regulate uh on terms of rp and then maybe a little bit of load if i feel like they're underperforming or or try to overperform but that's just a that's also the the mental side and having to work really close with an athlete in terms of okay you got to trust each other so you got to what you're saying is you got to be real with me otherwise you might be hurting yourself mm. so we also have to build a a bit of a type of yeah a good understanding from each other yeah i think for the listeners as well i think we're i mean they don't have access to full-time strength condition coaches physios etc nah. and a whole team to help them so a lot of the times okay let's take your shoulder injury for example they go to the physio they do their whatever exercises they do and there's a clear black and white when you go, when I guess it's a private physio and you're training, you'll be, okay, you can't do this. And then you, they go through their four, eight weeks of physio. And then it's going from, you can't do anything. Now you can do everything. And obviously that p presents problems for the practitioner because you go from doing nothing to, okay, now you can go back to full training and do everything, which obviously they either re-aggravate the injury, re-injure it, injure something else because they weren't prepared, whatever. So the in-between stage, is there maybe some advice, some tips, some things that you like to do to get people ready to go back onto the mats or on the cage or whatever it is? And we can use your, your shoulder um, mm. injury as an example. Yeah, that's that's that, that has been the one of the hardest parts, but also the 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 experiment we tried about one and a half years ago to uh, to to see where how we can tran transition from that that kind of first phase until let's call it fifth phase because there's actually a lot of two three four five maybe even more oh, phases awesome. in between yeah, let's talk um, this. and then so what happens is that as soon as you can start moving your your arm again and then we call we say to 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 the general public we say oh you can brush your teeth again or you can drink your beer or you can cut your cut your steak again uh that's actually using your arm whereas that's great for an really in, uh, uh, just a general population, but these really enthusiastic athletes it doesn't really matter if you're if you're an amateur or a professional. If you want to be doing sports, you want to be get back into it. Uh, so you don't care about eating that steak. You care about how what can I do uh, as close to the sport as I can without well without actually doing the sport because you're not allowed to do it yet. Um, so we we try doing the like the most childish P that's where being a P teacher is actually really good because we, we bring, we bring movement back to the, to the, to the simplest thing ever as in, okay, we got balloons out. We got two balloons, uh, you versus me or me versus you. You can just get someone from your, from your, your dojo or, or whatever. Can you help me out? Sure. Here's a balloon. Here's a balloon. Okay. I'll chuck it in the air. You chuck it in the air. We run up and down, but you only use allowed to use your, uh, your injured arm. That's like a non-load bearing thing, but you're actually asking function from that arm or that shoulder without actually injuring it uh, mm -hmm. or or you or having some load on it. So we bring it back to the to the most simple things. It could be uh, it, we call balloons. It could be throwing as much cones at them, like s sitting on the floor throwing twenty cones at them, just catch them, or mm -hmm. throw a tennis ball or play. 
uh, one uppies against the wall with a with a volleyball, just up, up throw it against the wall. The other one throw it against the wall. Um, so anything that's that's ask a function from the arm, but doesn't involve impact and doesn't involve a chaotic movement like any combat sport is. Yeah. I mean, even Uchikomi forms from judo are too chaotic in the beginning because they ask a lot of rotation and 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 rotation and 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 strength from that and then so you can't do that so we start with just playing games and that that would that be considered phase two after yeah. the phase one okay yeah so, so what, and then, so what oh, yeah, no carry on carry on uh now so then that so that's playing games like that and then involving some kind of conditioning element to it or even a mental component to it um could be a um uh, could be a, a part of that phase gotcha yeah i, I really like that too i i talked about this briefly on short uh, the podcast with sean sherman a, a couple of episodes ago and about how for example like acr rehab instead of just balancing on whatever it is that some people do maybe it's balancing on something but throwing a ball back and forth or challenging that somehow because it takes your mind off the injury otherwise mm -hmm. you stand on it and you're focusing so much on the injury for example if, in your example with hitting the balloons in the air and then running and making a game out of it if you're just sitting there maybe hitting the balloon just by yourself you're focusing the whole time on the injured shoulder while you're doing it and often that restricts you you might have some pain whereas if you're doing other activities it seems to remove that yeah it's distracting them from what's actually happening uh especially well you it's just a there's a there's a way of thinking about the injury but it sometimes it, it's also vice versa you you have to deal with athletes that are scared of using it so yeah. you have to distract them or or just yeah uh so then yeah. that's that's part of it but that also at the same time like i said there's a there's also an opportunity to to implement mental strength in terms of okay well i can't be on a mat so i can't actually go into someone get stuck into someone and have that feeling of of winning and 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 and, and sub giving a submission to someone uh but what are my what what are my mental strengths slash weaknesses for my sport and what can i then work on uh and 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 try to funnel that into a into a game or into an element um we for example when the games could go up a little bit in terms of um, intensity, where they ac could actually get a bit of a heart rate up, we tried to play games. And then in the meantime, in the in the rest periods, I would rest because I'm old and I need to rest anyway. <laughs> those those pro athletes just keep going. Uh, so I give them a uh, what we did. We did a, um, there was this this sheet of 50, 50 numbers on them, and 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 she had to go out. She had to find them all on a list from one to fifty uh and then if she didn't make it then there would be a like a if she didn't make if she make it i would do something if if she made it i vice versa but it's it's about having that stress because she said oh yeah i'll find them all in in in, in three times one minute but she didn't get to 11 in three times one minute but that's also <laughs> that's also a mental challenge in terms of okay there's a rest period you need to rest so you need to focus on your rest while at the same time you're trying to do a um yeah it's a fun game but you also want to win it so you 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 have mm. to be, be ready to recover so you have to focus on your breathing you have to do all that whereas in a game or when someone's on the floor uh resting or and you need that 30 seconds recovery you're also doing the same thing so it's by that oh yeah i'm i think i feel comfortable but i'm actually being uncomfortable but i need to be feeling comfortable in order to get this done um and that's why we also chucked in a lot of these mental uh mental games to prepare them back uh oh, nice one of the weaknesses because she she put it down as one of our uh learn wanting to learn things uh mm -hmm. so we worked on that and then that builds huge confidence going back on the mat again interesting so would this be part of phase three adding this stuff in i could do it already at two uh it depends okay. like it depends on how hard you run after the balloons uh um <laughs> but uh, th there's also there's also um when there's a little bit of more stability in that shoulder in like a phase two slash three kind of situation you can also start doing 
kumikata or any grip kind of work with one arm and then mm. just hold your arm on like hold your arm on the shirt or or don't or you hold it here and just start fighting sideways on one arm uh or just I'll, I'll put a hand on you you just try to get rid of it with one arm and i just try to hold on for my life try to get rid of me so you do ask some some function from that from that non-injured arm well at the same time you're asking stability from the injured arm but gotcha. not at that kind of intensity and 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 bearing load bearing way that it can get injured again but you do ask a function okay. from it which you probably don't when you do a single arm uh dumbbell press in mm. a different way at least yeah no that, that's interesting so what's the difference between the phase two and the phase three i mean obviously that everything's on a spectrum it's not like you just go from two to three but what, what's the difference between the two when you're progressing um i think there's a there's a lot of games uh <laughs> non sports specific games in in phase two it's just act act uh asking function again and when we go to three it's more uh a combination between games and actually some sports specific work but okay. in still in game form so we could go play kumikata form where we try to get uh get that grip off or and i'll be attacking or i'll be defending uh we'll be playing games where i'll try to pin someone down on the floor and the other one just has to because you're on a pin position like this you can't use your shoulder so we are just asking them to turn a lot uh so there's you're on your you're on your back so you don't really you use your shoulders so you but you still have to get a little of that that sh that little mm. shimmy in the upper body that kind of games um we try to uh, even turn our belt around try to get the back of the belt games you did when you were five or six because mm. when i tried to get close to someone or try to get close to the other person he's still trying to get a away from you and use that arm or or not and then those little instances is where you can't injure someone even more, but you can still ask function from that arm or that, that shoulder or that upper body where, whereas they'll, yeah, you, you're actually training them because you're preparing them for what's coming instead of, okay, you're clear to go, go on the mat. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't done anything. I haven't, I haven't had no feeling whatsoever. And besides that, the other person standing in front of me tries to kill me. So. <laughs> so then we try to that's that should be like a, a phase three and then um there's a lot of things you can do on the floor already on your back and then uh getting that yeah getting that in so so for the for the grip game and for grabbing the belt you, you you're using the non-injured arm on those or would you still would you also yeah. incorporate some of the injured arm stuff we later on we did that but we first started on the non-injured arm gotcha. and then we Play those games to get an understanding for that game uh because then later on we used a um we used the rope so i mm -hmm. hold the rope on my on one end and then the other person holds the rope on the injured arm but we still play the game so yeah you're holding a rope but we're not actually using that arm to play that game we're just using it to hold a rope which is like a a short rope but because because i'm trying to uh, play with it the other arm gets gets some movement in but i'm not putting pressure on that non on that injured arm i'm just holding a rope i'm not pulling on it or moving it i'm just it's it's a bit of a like a an, an implicit way of using that arm but not actually using it um so we try to trick it trick the the athletes into actually doing no. something with it but not no, for real yet did you know you can represent sweet arts of fighting while you're training with more than just a membership we also have rash guards and shorts if you're watching this on youtube you'll see that we have the sweet arts of fighting 2.0 shorts and we also have the sweet arts of fighting short and long sleeve rash guard there is another design coming soon but you can get those on xmarshall.com and you can go down the description and you can find that and back to the podcast nice no, I like, I like um, this because, it, I mean, this, this applies for all grappling athletes, but it, I mean, even strikers can use a lot of these drills anyway, even though they're specific, some are specific to judo. I mean, if you have an injured shoulder, this is going to start to bring back some of that function. But do you want to maybe dive into phase four and then, and then phase five as well? Yeah, no, 100%. So when, when, when we're more into phase four, we, we actually, we can use a bit more Uchikomi where you actually 
um, get into a bit of uh, okay, so what kind of the throws you do or the uh, the movements you make, and you can do that because it doesn't have to be a finish. Um, we can just go be really close to each other and then use that arm to put a little bit of rotation in. But then some athletes have these really cool overhead uh trolls where they will, will they be here and then oh sorry what's better on the camera here but they'll be here and then they go all the way here like, let's not do that troll yet let's start let's start with leg sweeps first and then uh and so so we'll start gotcha. we'll start here first and then later on we'll start here and then so we'll we'll get we'll start with leg sweeps and then move gradually up instead of so not no rotation on the arm slide rotation on the arm open rotation on the arm and then but that's just technical work and then not really finishing uh we've been there's been these yeah you've been probably done it a hundred times in, in rugby preseason where you do all this no gi grappling uh what with rugby mm -hmm. you just yeah we're just on the field so it's always no gi anyway yeah. but you'll you do those well grappling while holding someone try to get away um that doesn't ask a lot of rotation from the shoulder but it does ask a little bit of that quasi isometric um strength needed strength whereas that's great to prepare for the next step which is going to be falling and throwing and 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 getting thrown where so so that we actually played rugby uh we did tackling we did uh where you, you oh, yeah, well. where you sit on where you sit on your knees you pull someone forward to go for the jackal so i will pull yeah. someone forward it hits the floor and that's that impact on the shoulder um nice. which athletes love as well to play while doing the rugby uh, oh sorry we're doing the judo or a sport and then adding another sport in which is close by but not not as far away so mm -hmm. they love they love the rugby um because it's 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 contact it's nevasa uh it's it's grappling so that all that kind of um adds in and then at the same time we also did a lot of no gi work uh just get rash guards on and 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 do that kind of nevasa because it doesn't allow and then no no arm bars and all that kind of stuff but just so we yeah. we we kind of structured it into okay yeah. no arm bars uh we can do we can do any neck work but we can't stretch or rotate arms so it's it's just let's go only pin someone down that's when you win. Mm. Uh, so that's when you 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 just take some of the boundaries of you make boundaries in terms of okay we're not that's not going to happen to a shoulder, that's not going to happen there. Uh, whereas you still ask a lot of function from that shoulder and there's, there's a lot of rolling over that shoulder. Unless there's a lot of mm. strength in it, and then that way kind of you can already build a lot of strength and sport specific qualities. Whereas you don't get that dangerous part where you might be injured or you might get into too much rotation where where the injury actually happened where you can't mm -hmm. get yet get to yet um yeah, yeah that's kind of and how then, uh, phase four looks a little bit yeah and then and then progressing into phase five you're <clears throat> starting to ramp up to get back to full training um that 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 should then be six but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that if you if you if you want to go there then that now that's first five is where in a safe environment whereas it with a coach or a designated other athlete or someone you trust uh you start building up uh mm. hard hard kumakata work or even uh harder with me where you get thrown uh we'll do full nevasa uh whereas because you don't have to be thrown or you don't have to fall it's just only floor work um so we'll go build a lot of load in minutes in that uh and then get them fatigued uh at some point we did even tack uh like a, a shark tank idea where we you got two athletes where we worked for four minutes uh, the athlete worked for four minutes and then mm -hmm. I worked for two and another person worked for two because that's kind of that specific overload that mm, an, an athlete on itself can't really create whereas two athletes can overload those four minutes um, but in a safe environment so all with rules whereas we do, would know arm bars or, or, or whatever so all rhythm rules um, but yeah, it's 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 we have to start fighting again, and then uh, that's the that's where we where we went from there. 
uh, we, a, a typical end stage five training would be, for example, five times two minutes of no gi grappling, uh, and then build it and then get the gi on and, and have a, I think we started at five times two minutes and we ended up at four times four minutes with a two yeah. or three minute rest. Whereas as, as we with another athlete though at the end and that's when we said okay if you can do three to four times four minutes i think you're ready for uh to to go back into technical training with other athletes again nice, um, nice. I, like it. I like how you have that kind of, you have that i wouldn't say boundary but you have that uh i guess end point where okay you've done this you're, you're pretty much ready to go <laughs> yeah and that's that's just a that's that's not just a combination of the minutes I just prescribed, it's also the, oh, well, well how does the athlete progress mentally through it? Did, did she feel confident? Yeah. That's why we brought in trust, trust the athletes, other athletes that, that the person trusts because it's still, yeah, we're still doing combat sports where you got the other person trying to kill you, but then, yeah. so you need to have some trust for that other person that, that you're gonna, you fight with. Uh, so that's, it's, it's a mental part. There's a physical part to it, and then there's also okay, where, uh, where can we put you in in the trainings during the week? Uh, yeah. But also, how much strength difference is there still in in certain ranges? Um, mm. And is that is that is that deficit small enough to be uh, uh, to think that it's uh, to say it's safe to to yeah. go from there? Yeah, uh, regarding like that phase four, kind of getting used to hitting the ground. Obviously, with with judo, you're getting thrown. I mean, jujitsu, most grappling, you're being thrown to the floor. Obviously, you mentioned, for example, tackling from the knees and then and then falling onto the elbows. There is one way of doing it. How else are you progressing the athlete to be able to handle impacts now? Because I, I can imagine phase five is rather scary for a lot of them going into full mm. contact, mm -hmm. throwing and being thrown onto the floor, and for example, an upper body injury like that. Yeah, yeah. So I've basically done my whole rugby preseason template oh, nice. from the first four weeks gotcha. of grappling. Okay. I put them through, uh, uh, and that that could be that 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 could be anything. That could be the the the, the throw the pulling forward and falling on your arms with a ball, uh, especially using the ball so you don't uh, uh, catch yourself, but you actually accept the mm -hmm. the hit. Uh, we've done we use crash mats. Uh, which we've even put up to three or four mats high where someone That's just right. gets thrown over the shoulder. But then as soon as someone's on the shoulder, it actually hit, hit, the, hit the mats already. And we bring the mats down over the week. So even in the training, if it's confident enough, um, any form of um, uh Chaos push-ups on a band, for example, uh, having gotcha. uh, depth, little depth push-ups, uh, straight mm -hmm. arm, depth push-up catches, that kind of work. Um, getting like half kilo balls, throwing them to a person, having them accept them here, and then throwing them as hard as they can against the wall. So mm -hmm. that's all. All that is a combination of an, an integrated approach to to rehab, whereas, okay, yeah, you have that sport specific on the mat, you have the fissure working, and then you have the SNC next to it, looking at that uh, chaotic side of things. Uh, and that, that, that integration, that combination of everything built you, uh, built you back. But it, we also did climbing, uh, mm. like, what is it? Bouldering is the English word for it or not? Yeah, yep. I yeah. think so, yeah. Different types. <laughs> So we also did that, uh, and then swimming because uh, you actually need to go and then pull back as hard as you can. So yeah. all that kind of those other things that are not necessarily sport specific uh, can can be a great asset to it. No, oh, I like that. And some if someone's listening to this, looking to kind of go through some of these phases. How do they know when they're ready to progress through to the next phase? Um. <sighs> Yeah, you can set a few weeks for it. We try to get, okay, so we try to get as a lot of similar exercises throughout the weeks and we just ask them, okay, do you feel confident? Uh, so out of one to 10, how much, how confident do you feel in this exercise compared to last week or at the moment? So whereas, okay, if you feel an eight, being confident with doing this, I have a 
I, I know you will go full on with this exercise so you don't hold back. Um, and then I, usually after every set, if I didn't notice a, uh, a change in mood with an athlete or, or, or a change in pressure, which they, which I feel then, uh, then I would ask at the end of like a, a block, uh, I would ask them, okay, how are you, are you still confident? How's the pain? Um, in, on the RP, all on RP scales of one to 10 and then, uh, so confidence, pain, and what was the last one? Uh, oh, and exp I would explain the next exercise and, and seeing how they felt about the next exercise as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's more of a, it's more of a com confidence and pain thing. If someone's doing this on their own, you know, are they, are they tentative going into whatever the exercise is? Um, and if so, maybe they need more time at the, at the previous one, if they're not, you know, fully yeah. confident in it. Well, we also used, um, which is. We use the microfet as well, which is that kind of pressure, little little pressure thing that a lot of physios have. Um, mm -hmm. Where in certain positions from the shoulder, we we try to see how how much pressure they could give, and then uh, how much that would differ from left to right. Um, yeah. So you can also ask your physiotherapist um, to 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 take those tests from you and see if there's still a lot of difference, uh, because that has been a lot of, um, helping me guide making SNC, whereas someone was still lagging a little bit above, uh, so a little bit above here and then, okay, I'm still lagging strength here. So might be not smart to do overhead presses yet. Uh, whereas mm. it, it would be, uh, in, in terms of the, um, rehab, pad or the times time pad timeline sorry um that would be okay but you're still lagging strength there we might have to look at it different but it's an easy accessible tool which uh, from my experience a lot of physiotherapists have at their at their at their practice so you can also ask them that, that, that that's just a yeah. grip a grip dynamometer right a grip um no, it's um, it's, uh, it's 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 like a half a tennis ball and it has like a, uh, a compression pad on it. And then the fissure will hold it like this and then you push into it and then it, it, it will measure a amount of force you can put into uh, it. Okay. And then it, it comes back with a, with a number and that's the difference in force you can apply in those different angles, uh, which can help you guide gotcha. S and C, but also can guide our specific mat training. Gotcha. And, and for anyone who's listening to this without watching the video, Michael was just kind of showing the different shoulder, but essentially adding pressure to this ball in different shoulder positions. And you can kind of compare, compare side to side in different positions and see if basically see if you're really correct. Yeah. Or the, it, it, we don't really have numbers yet to be ready. It's more as in, yeah. okay, how much difference is there still in strength? Gotcha. Uh, mm -hmm. And how, or how much, sorry, how much, yeah, how much deficit is there left versus right? Uh, gotcha. I, I can't, I can't go about, I can't hundred percent say it's, it's about clearance. It's more about yeah, a deficit yeah. and in terms of how far we are with, with getting that right. Uh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Now that this is, this has been awesome. Michael, going through the, these five phases and hopefully the, the listeners are able to maybe take something out for, for themselves if they're, if they're going through a, a minor injury themselves, but if people want to follow you and find you, see what you're working on and everything, where can they do that? Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, Michiel van Kolk, I'll, I'll say it, I'll say it my way oh, right now, um, that. <laughs> but that's just my, just my full, that's my full name is just, uh, if you type it in Instagram, that's also, uh, the, uh, the, my Instagram and then, uh, um, further than that, if you have any questions, just shoot me a message there and I'm always happy to chat about, uh, what we've done and, and, and if I can help out or any specific questions to where they are at now, I'm happy to, uh, to help out and, uh, and chat. Sweet. Now I'll link that Instagram down in the description as well for anyone listening, but, uh, thanks for coming on, Michael. I appreciate it. Yes. Thanks for having me.